SIG CSE, or SIG C as the Cognoscenti seem to call it. Um, and that's an audience that I don't address a lot. So part of the content that you guys are going to get is aimed at a SIG C audience that maybe is not as sophisticated as you guys are uh, in terms of software as a service and why it's good for you. What I'll try to do is for this audience, skip over some of that. But be aware that uh, some of what you're going to hear is going to seem like preaching to the choir. So I'll try to get past that. Um, Despite the fact that I'm going to focus on a particular approach we've taken at Cal, I am not arguing for any particular language or framework. I know that people have favorite languages and stuff like that. Uh, nor am I arguing that our approach to teaching software as a service is the only one. But I think we have learned something pretty valuable in the last couple of years of doing this, which is we can improve the undergraduate learning experience and the preparation of undergrads to be employed at places like Google um, and at the same time, make them feel happier about what they're learning, give them higher satisfaction if we use software as a service as a teaching vehicle uh, and if we're careful about the languages and tools we use. So I'm going to tell you about how we've evolved a course that tries to do this and what our experiences have been in doing that. Um, and as a, a, by way of background, um, I work in the UC Berkeley Rad Lab, which is uh, on the tail end of its five-year mission to explore strange new worlds and to apply machine learning to the operation of large data centers. Uh, so long story short, uh, we had this mission statement that if we applied machine learning to operational problems, we could make it possible for somebody with a great idea for a web application to go from conception to deployment to scaling without having to re-architect the app every time. And although uh, Berkeley has a pretty good track record of doing technology stuff, uh, faculty in particular have a terrible track record of coming up with really interesting driving applications. And our idea was we were going to get Berkeley undergrads to develop web apps, which they would deploy on our infrastructure and test our ideas out. <clears throat> and it occurred to us that there was no course at Berkeley in which they were being taught how to do this. So we kind of started a pilot course really for selfish reasons. We were going to teach undergrads how to do software as a service. Then we were going to hire the best ones and get them to build applications to show off our technology infrastructure. That's kind of where this came from. Uh, Google has been a very big supporter, uh, both of the research and now of the educational work, along with a lot of other companies, uh, many of which are in the software as a service space. So with that background, uh, I'll talk a little bit about the uh, origins of the course and what we had hoped to accomplish with it. Uh, the case for using software as a service as the way to teach software engineering to undergraduates. Uh, I'll talk about the particular uh, way that we taught the course, which is to use agile development with iterations, which turns out to be a great fit for undergraduate reality. Uh, a little bit about what we've learned from doing the course and some informal reflections. Uh, and just a discussion with you guys on where to go next. So I'm looking really for feedback on, on a couple of different things. First of all, on the, uh, you know, the, the way that I'm organizing the talk around these topics, but also ideas about the process itself and what you would put into a course like this, or if you're a relatively recent grad, what you would have liked to see in a course like this. Uh, and by the way, interactive and everything, so butt right in. Um, I'm going to kind of skip over this section for you guys, but the, the gist is for an audience that doesn't already understand that software as a service is the way to have rapid impact in software today, uh, I need to explain to them that uh, application platforms like software as a service mean that two people can affect millions of people overnight. Uh, I know that at Google this is sort of, you know, it's, it's in the DNA, uh, but it's worth remembering that not everybody is in this culture. So I'm going to blow back, blow through this for you. I have some great screenshots of early eBay in 1995 and how in 1999 they were on the front page of the New York Times for bad reasons. Um, and the fact that uh, by the time we got to the 2000s, uh, it was pretty clear that not only could you build cool services, you could take advantage of other people's cool services to make yours even better. So kind of the earliest example I remember uh, was uh, Housing Maps, which was a mashup of Google Maps with Craigslist. Um, Facebook has now uh, published a bunch of APIs where your apps can integrate with uh, Facebook social network. Um, and we think that going forward, uh, in 2020, pretty much everything is going to be delivered as a service, maybe except for some really critical parts of you know, game UIs, things, things that have severe constraints on interactivity. Um, and this idea that you know, you're doing releases every week, uh, that you know, you're a lot closer to your customers, that now with cloud computing, there isn't really a financial barrier to doing this. Uh, software as a service is just going to become more important. So this part of the background, again, I think for, for this audience, it's received wisdom. Uh, but I wanted to make sure that I set this up as software as a service is something that students actually care about. And I think they recognize that there is a path to deploying something as a service that's really cool and having immediate impact like overnight. Um, so that makes the motivation easy from the student's point of view. Um, that means that we need models of software development that are a better fit for this extremely fast-paced process. And when we started the Rad Lab, 
uh, we kind of use this slide to boil down the difference between the traditional, you know, big design up front waterfall model, which is what, for the most part, we had been teaching students in software engineering, as compared to the models that are more commonly used in companies that develop software as a service. Uh, so we came up with, you know, kind of names for these four phases. You develop an app, you assess and test it, you deploy it, and then there's an operations phase. Uh, and in fact, it's often the same small team that has responsibilities in all those areas. They're much more tightly knit than under a traditional model where you've got requirements gathering, then you kind of turn it over for customer tests, and then you deploy it, and then the programmers go away and, and you operate it. Um, so this new model of software development uh, demands some kind of methodology that actually is amenable to the rapid pace. And we decided that we were going to try to teach students uh, using agile methods. Um, Dilbert's comments notwithstanding, you know, the, the, the kind of the negative view of agile methods is that forget about documentation. Just you know, you go start talk, you go start coding, and I'll sit down and talk to the customers. Um, what we think is important about it is, uh, although everyone tells us that teaching students about testing is really important, we found that teaching agile development uh, with behavior-driven development and test-first development actually makes it practical to do this. Um, and I'm going to spend a, probably a big chunk of the talk discussing specifically how we managed to do that and how that's been received by the students. Okay. So let me talk a little about what we had hoped to do uh, with this course. Uh, so using software as a service as a vehicle, here's what we wanted the students to take out of the course. Uh, there's kind of some basic stuff that goes with any software engineering course, which is uh, principles of object-oriented design, how you architect something getting from a, an initial design to classes and methods, uh, the use of design patterns, how you recognize the opportunity to apply something that's been tried before. Uh, there's another aspect, which is uh, productivity by reusing well-designed abstractions. So uh, we found students seem to be very much in the habit of success being measured by the number of lines of code they write, as opposed to by the amount of functionality delivered. And we wanted to sort of get away from that a little bit. Uh, we wanted to teach students some very basic level of self-management and project planning. So uh, what this translates into is, we don't want you to spend four all-nighters before the demo deadline getting your demo to work. We know you can get your demo to work, but we want to teach you a process that will actually be tractable if you were to take a job as a professional programmer. Um, and part of that means being able to estimate how hard is it going to be to do something, how do I know if my estimates are off, how do I account for that as I do more planning. Um, and you need to learn some team skills, not just technical stuff like how to use GitHub, uh, but some social things like you know how you split up the work among n people, how you agree on interface boundaries and stuff like that. Um, and last but far from least, uh, every single industrial affiliate that we had, when we, we went to poll them and he said, as future employers of our students, what's the top two or three things that you would want to fix about undergraduate education? And this is what they all said. This was number one, two, and three on everybody's list was uh, students are not being taught enough about testing. They don't understand how important it is. They don't understand how to really internalize the idea that testing is not a chore that you do after the code is written because you need points, but that it's an integral part of the process. So you know, in terms of our priorities, it was really important that we get the third one right, because this is an area where uh, previous versions of these courses clearly hadn't been up to snuff. So that means that comparing uh, our plans for the course against a uh, traditional software engineering course, uh, first of all, it's an open-ended project. You would get to pick the app that you were going to design as opposed to doing fill-in-the-blanks programming, and your app would be expected to work. So you know, kind of like a capstone design course, we don't want to just see a bunch of code written. We, we want to see an integrated artifact that actually runs. Uh, we, in fact, some of them were so successful, uh, as I'll describe, that they continued life after the class was over, uh, either as projects that were continued by the students extracurricular or as .coms or .orgs. Um, we were going to focus on software as a service as the thing you build, so not a handheld app, not a Java app that runs on your desktop, but something that runs in the infrastructure. And the way you demo it is you give us a URL, and we go there, and, and we test it out. Um, and kind of a secondarily, it would be great if there was a, a way that we could bring back some of these big ideas that we teach students early in their careers uh, about languages and programming and high productivity, but they never get to use these ideas again because most of their courses they have to program in Java and C++, uh, which really doesn't allow for expression of some of these big ideas. So I'll, I'll come back to that as well. So compared to other courses, this is kind of what we thought we were doing differently. Um, and that means that I have kind of three choices that I have to justify. Uh, why is software as a service the right vehicle? Why is uh, the Agile methodology a good choice? And why Ruby on Rails, which is the framework we ended up using? For some reason, I think the third one may be the most contentious in this audience, but that's, that's not going to stop me from going there. Um, roughly, we thought one good reason for software as a service, besides the fact that it's very easy to sell students on 
being able to have high impact through this vehicle uh, is that we found the agile development methodology is a great fit for software as a service. Uh, we showed students how to use user stories as both their uh, unit of planning and work progress and also as their integration testing. And that seems to work particularly well for software as a service because of the, the natural request reply uh, interface that web apps present. Um, and because the, the culture of software as a service already is that we deploy frequently, right? We, we de uh, you know, places that deploy weekly or even more frequently, um, it'd be great if we could map that to the hectic pace of an undergraduate semester where they, they have a bunch of classes they're taking, they have a calculus of what is due next and how they schedule when they're gonna do the work. This is a way that we can actually get weekly progress in the class and count that as a measurable part of your grade, right? So we have, part, part of the process we're gonna teach you is how to actually do estimation and project planning and, and tracking. Um, and we're gonna count that as part of the evaluation. We know you can get the demos to work, but that's not the important part. The important part's the process. Um, and as I said, the impact aspect was easy to sell, right? If you do a really good project demo, because you're deploying it publicly, everybody can see it, not just the instructors of the class. Um, you guys don't need to be introduced to cloud computing, but again, for the Sig C audience, uh, I just wanted to point out that because we can pay per server hour, uh, we can get you know, hundreds of servers for an hour for the same time as one server for hundreds of hours. That turns out to be really useful for deploying software as a service when project deadlines come. Uh, so this slide is not really aimed at you guys. Um, but cloud computing really has made it tractable for us in ways that I'll come back to because I know a lot of people in this audience uh, are in that area. Uh, the other question is why Ruby and why Rails? And you know, this uh, maybe was the most controversial decision at the time. Uh, for those of you who aren't familiar with it, uh, actually, who's, is anyone not familiar with Ruby and Rails? At least to know kind of what it is. Okay, I think in the 60 audience there'll be more people, but roughly speaking, Rails is a very productive framework for creating web apps, software as a service. Ruby is a tasteful and productive language, and I don't think that's a matter of opinion. I think it really is one of the more tastefully designed languages out there. Uh, it has very good code density uh, in the good sense of having to write less code to get more stuff done, which generally means you make fewer mistakes. Uh, we have found through experience that for teaching some of these big ideas about reuse and modularity, like higher order programming and use of closures and stuff like that, this appears to be the least intrusive language that also has practical applications. So that, that is a point in its favor. Uh, and we believe that it actually does incorporate really good ideas from scripting languages, from functional programming, from small talk. Um, however, almost uh, you know, dwarfing all the other things, because testing was so important for us to, to convey and to get students to buy into, we needed something that had a good testing ecosystem. And the Ruby on Rails testing ecosystem really rocks. Um, even according to programmers I know who live by Python, they wish that the testing tools were as good. And this, I think, has turned out to make a big difference. So I'll, I'll show some concrete examples of what it is like to be a student in this class a little bit later in the talk. Um, my one slide overview of Rails for those who haven't used it. Uh, so on the right is kind of the canonical three-tier application diagram that, that students uh, mostly have seen before. You've got uh, a web browser interacting with a web server. You've got some kind of uh, engine that runs your application logic, and you've got some storage on the back end. Uh, very roughly speaking, um, what you get from Rails is a model view controller version of this framework where the models uh, are object relational mappers over the database. The controllers uh, incorporate some logic for routing URLs and for handling actions taken by the user while they're on a web page. And the views are templates that can have some embedded code in them. It's called the, the rendering engine. So it's a pretty standard model view controller. Uh, there's a nice ORM layer. There's uh, packages that give you uh, baselines for doing the templating and, and doing the controllers. And Rails is roughly that collection of stuff. So to the extent that what you're developing is an app that matches this paradigm, I'm interacting through a web browser, I take specific actions, there's business logic that responds, and a result is somehow rendered and returned to me. Um, it's a framework really designed around that paradigm. So the, we're now at the point where I can talk about, um, there we go, whoops, what I call the, uh, the software as a service love triangle. Um, and this is kind of the, the three choices that we made. Uh, we chose Ruby on Rails, we chose cloud computing for software and software as a service, and we chose agile development. And what I try to do is explain why it is that pulling out any one of these actually hurts more than one thing. I think this is a pretty clever diagram, by the way. Um, but you know, the idea of how do we teach software architecture, how do we teach lessons about code reuse and modularity? Uh, well, cloud computing or software as a service 
gives us kind of a built-in starting architecture, which is model view controller. Uh, but Ruby on Rails makes it possible to get reuse and modularity at multiple levels of the stack, something that's more difficult to do with other languages. How do we teach students good testing discipline? Uh, agile development lends itself very well to doing test-first design and incremental development, but you also need really, really good tools that stay out of students' way when they're trying to learn those lessons, and the Ruby on Rails ecosystem has those tools. So this, you know, I, I think we've kind of found an interesting uh, three stools of the, uh, three pillars of the stool or something like that, um, that actually all work together to provide the student experience that we found in the class. Uh, kind of, you know, what do we cover? Uh, there's some parts of this that are standard software engineering fair and some parts that are pretty specific to software as a service and you wouldn't need to cover otherwise. Uh, as with most software engineering courses, we talk about design patterns, software architecture in the large, good coding practices. Uh, we talk about test-first development and unit testing, for which we use an awesome tool called RSpec. We do behavior-driven design and integration testing with a tool called Cucumber. Uh, and by the way, I'll have kind of screenshots of all of these so you can see what they're like. Uh, this is all open source stuff, by the way. Um, we do agile uh, project management and project planning, and we use a tool called Pivotal Tracker uh, to keep track of progress and see if students are actually making good estimates of how hard things are going to be. Uh, we teach version control for small team projects. We use Git and GitHub for that. Uh, we used to use Google Code, but we switched for esoteric reasons that you can ask me about offline. Um, and for uh, software as a service technologies and how do you deploy and operate software as a service, we've been using a combination of Amazon EC2 and Heroku. Anybody heard of Heroku? Show of hands. Uh, Heroku is to Rails as App Engine is to Python, plus or minus. Um, Gasp, what we had to leave out, and I thought I'd be upfront about this. Uh, in an 11-week course, there's a limited amount that you can cover. We don't talk much about concurrency in the sense of uh, race conditions and, and you know, multi-threaded programming. Uh, part of it is that uh, there's just no time in the class and you have to pick your battles. Part of it is also that we believe the time may be better spent on other topics, uh, including, for example, the kinds of parallelism that arise when you're doing horizontal scaling of a web application. We don't discuss formal verification. Uh, we talk about it as a field and we give an overview of what people do, but there's no assignments where you get any practice in it. Uh, performance testing, we, we do some specific things, again, centered around the kinds of performance that you care about for software as a service, uh, but we don't do sort of detailed performance analysis and modeling. Uh, we talk about mutation and random testing, but again, there isn't really a set of assignments where students work on it. Um, and we don't do traditional waterfall model where, you know, you go gather requirements, and then you refine the requirements, and then you write some code, and then you figure out what the acceptance tests are. What we found is that the Agile method lets us replace that with many versions of that that you do once a week. And that actually seems tractable for undergrads. On, on the schedule that they have to keep, delivering a small amount of stuff that's self-contained every week or two uh, actually seems to result in higher quality code than delivering a whole bunch of stuff with uh, milestones that are spread further apart. Uh, we did two lectures a week, about 75 minutes per lecture. There's a small group section with a TA, so that there's about 70 students in the course. Small group sections were about half that size. Uh, so, uh, and those are all 90-minute meetings. For the first eight weeks of the course, they'd have kind of a homework per week, and then for the second eight weeks, they would be working on their final project. And we're just doing iteration-based design with one week being one iteration. Um, two exams, no final, and the project is think of a web app that you would like or that you or your friends would, would want to have and use, and you're going to prototype that and take it all the way to deployment and operations. So small teams of three to five students, Amazon calls these one pizza teams, uh, design reviews about every other week with the core staff just to keep things on track. We have a final demo where we invite outsiders from outside the department and so forth. Uh, and students are evaluated not just on the demo, but on test coverage, uh, on their coding style. We actually have the TAs look through their code. And we also ask their peers uh, to sort of rank each other. How, how did they all perform as members of the team? So here's what it's like to teach this class. Uh, let me just get a sanity check there on time. Uh, so this is a week in the life of a student in CS169. This is what they're doing uh, really once they're into the project phase of the class, after we've covered some of the basics. They've learned Ruby, they've learned Rails, they've learned how to use some of the testing tools. Here's an overview of the process that they use. They have an idea for an application initially or later on for a feature they'd like to add. And the first thing they do is they prototype the idea in low fidelity with paper sketches, UI sketches, and storyboards. They turn those into wireframes. Uh, they've learned enough HTML and CSS to do that. Uh, from there, they go to user stories and scenarios to describe in more detail what specifically happens when a user interacts with that feature of the application. 
And from those scenarios, they get two things. Uh, they get from the scenarios to the class level architecture of what they're going to write. And to help them with that, we use uh, collaborate class responsibility collaborator cards, which I'll show you. Uh, they also use those to identify places where their design uh, actually admits of using an existing design pattern. And here I'm talking about the sort of the famous gang of four design patterns are, are basically the ones we teach, a small superset of that. Once they have the scenarios, they're now going to use uh, behavior-driven design to drive method-level APIs from those scenarios. And uh, I'll show you how they use a tool called Cucumber to do that. Uh, from those uh, method-level APIs, they now have to actually write the code that implements the methods. And for that, they do test-first design, uh, sorry, test-first development using RSpec. Now they've got code that's actually running. And by the way, because they've developed it from a scenario that uh, was a user-facing scenario, and through test-first design, they now have a free set of unit tests and a free set of integration tests for that scenario. As they're doing this, they're using a Pivotal Tracker to plan which scenarios they're going to work on during any given week, uh, estimating the difficulty that they believe it's going to require, and then actually comparing that against reality at the end of each iteration, and adjusting their plans accordingly for what they think they're going to deliver uh, by the end of the semester. Um, and once they've gotten this far, They'll deploy that branch, uh, and they'll have their new feature up on the web. That's the checkoff. So checkoff is not turning in a homework. Checkoff is we take a git snapshot on the due date, and we check out what you've deployed. And that's the thing that you're evaluated on. Um, and then uh, you get a new feature idea, and you start the whole process over again with a new branch for that feature. So this is a week in the life of a project in CS169. And what I'm going to do next uh, is actually show a little bit more detail how they approach each of these steps. Um, again, I know that some of this may be uh, familiar material to some people here, and I think some of it may be new. Um, but what I'm trying to show is how the overall flow actually gets students thinking in terms of testing uh, in a way that, that I think is pretty unusual for undergrads at this point. <clears throat> so they start off with lo-fi UI sketches. This is kind of a, a well-known, uh, inexpensive methodology in HCI to very quickly prototype what you think the app should look like. And as you can imagine, it lends itself particularly well to web applications, because not only can you sketch out roughly what the page would look like, right? You're, you're dealing with a known amount of real estate and stuff like that. Um, you can also actually do a small set of storyboards. So for a handful of different high-level features of your app, literally what you're doing is you're, you're doing pencil and paper sketches uh, at this level of fidelity as to what you want the app to look like. And from these sketches, you can get to just enough XHTML and CSS to get a browser to display this. All right, so step one is, uh, think about how you as a user would want to interact with it, get it into this format, and then uh, kind of take the next step and create some basic templates around that. Um, the next step from here is to actually make that more concrete. So this involves generating user stories and scenarios, and then using those to actually get to the code you want to write. So how do they do that? Um, again, for those of you who are, may not be familiar with the concept, uh, user story is a unit of progress that describes how a particular stakeholder would interact with the application. And they're really simple. It, you know, there's almost, what's amazing about this method is that no individual step is complicated and that it actually works pretty well. Um, you write one to three sentence description of what the feature is supposed to be in everyday language. Uh, the you know, traditional practice is if it doesn't fit on an index card, then the story is too complicated and you need to subdivide it into simpler stories. Um, and the format uh, is typically something that expresses what kind of stakeholder I am with respect to the app, what I want to achieve, um, and then what task I perform uh, interacting with the application to do that. So I, I have a, you know, kind of a concrete example. I, uh, I think I'm unusual among faculty in that I actually maintain a customer-facing app on behalf of a nonprofit. So uh, an example user story from our app, which is used by a nonprofit theater, uh, is as a box office manager, uh, I want to be able to quickly find volunteers to help me in the box office. And to do that, I want to be able to tag patrons who are kind of my best customers as potential volunteers. All right, so pretty simple. Um, and what we're going to see is that this is both the unit of planning and the acceptance test can be derived from this. Uh, so the reason is that one story can encompass multiple scenarios. Right? To actually make those things happen, um, there have to be some specific interactions that the box office manager would take with the system. Uh, for example, I need to be able to search for a patron and add a label to them. Uh, I need to be able to remove labels. I need to be able to do a search by the labels I've added. So you can kind of see how getting from a general description of the goal to be achieved, you start enumerating specific interactions that would be required that you would have to implement to achieve that goal. Which means that the next level of refinement after this is that 
uh, I'm, I'm using a different feature here, but uh, for uh, illustrative purposes, it should be the same. Um, I go from my high-level user story, which is that top part, and now I'm going to start enumerating what the specific scenarios are. So this is a slightly different one. It's, uh, you know, I'm developing something like a, a, you know, buy tickets online for a movie, like Fandango or something, and the feature is, uh, as a patron, I want to add tickets to a shopping cart, easy enough. Um, and now I start breaking this out into possible specific actions that I'd have to do. One action is finding a specific movie. Sorry about the, the overlap there. Uh, if I know what movie I want to see, um, then I should be able to search for that movie and visit the buying tickets page for that movie. Another scenario might be, uh, maybe I can't go to that showing, but I want to find out what other showings are available. How would I do that? So again, I'm getting from the high-level user story to specific scenarios, each of which describes a discrete interaction between the user and the application. The other thing I, I can now get from these scenarios is I can start thinking about how am I going to have to structure my code in order to do these. So a simple trick uh, that we teach the students is, well, if you identify all the nouns in your user story, those are good candidates for what might end up becoming concrete classes. So in this case, a movie, a showing seems to be a first class entity here, tickets, and an order. Uh, and then if you identify the verbs, those are the likely responsibilities that those classes would have. So the next step is to go from here to class responsibility collaborator cards, uh, another very simple index card based concept. Um, so we have basically for each one of the classes, we can write down what its responsibilities are. Uh, so it's in case of a ticket, a ticket has to know how much it costs, it has to know who bought it, it has to know the name of the movie that it's for, and so on. And we identify who its collaborators are. Right Now this is not necessarily identical to what you're going to get as the class structure, but it's a starting point for thinking about it. Um, and I think, again, part of what has been useful about this methodology is that even though none of the steps in the sequence are rocket science, there, there's sort of a, a way to get from initial conception to code architecture that makes it unlikely you'll do a really bad job. Right? It, there's, there'll certainly be room for improvement. And at this point, you can apply a variety of sanity checks. If you've got a single class and you run out of room to write down the responsibilities, you might look for an opportunity to refactor it into multiple classes. Maybe you have a class that's trying to do too much. Uh, if the class has too many collaborators, maybe you've chosen the wrong modularization. Right? If you've got too many interactions between two different classes, maybe there's a third class that needs to be factored out that captures that relationship and then encapsulates some of those responsibilities. Um, and typically, we have students do this as a team. They're essentially sitting around a table with a stack of these cards describing uh, the possible uh, user stories, and they run one scenario at a time. We have one student become one particular actor. Right? I'm going to be you know, the, the movie-going patron, and we start walking through a scenario, and we just do sanity checks at each step. Uh, is there a place to factor out some responsibilities into a new class? Uh, are there too many interactions between these classes and so forth? Um, if there's too much duplication, we find that there are certain classes that are distinct, but they seem to have a lot of the same responsibilities. There are design patterns in the gang of four set that actually can factor out that related commonality. Let's look for a place to apply them. So this is probably where we have the most input with the students um, in helping them see where to apply these sanity checks and, and what to do about these situations. With those in hand, uh, the next thing to do is actually turn these into real code. And this is kind of where the tools start to become really important. Because so far, everything has been box and arrowware. And now we need to get from box and arrowware to actual running code. <clears throat> um, and we have found that Cucumber is a really excellent tool for being able to do this. Uh, essentially, I think of it as a way to turn user stories into acceptance tests. Uh, the idea is that you can actually keep your stories pretty much in, in plain language, although it's somewhat stylized, uh, in these given when and then, like I showed before in the scenarios. Um, and Cucumber will allow those stories to essentially become runnable code. The stories become your integration tests. So each of these you know, scenarios, uh, given this is the state of the world, when I do something, then something happens, really corresponds to one of those uh, class responsibility collaborators cards. Um, and then we have step definitions that for each step in the user story are going to match steps to the code. Now, this is much easier to show than it is to explain, so I'm just going to show it. Um, whoops. Uh, this works. There we go. And you guys, I hope you guys can sort of see that. OK, so uh, this is 
the user story that I showed on that first index card, which is about tagging customers with labels. And what's interesting about this, let me scroll back to the, there we go. So there's my feature, right? This is directly derived in some sense from that first index card when I said it would be great if a certain stakeholder could do this. What's interesting about this is that this is actually runnable code. This is an integration test in runnable form. And to get an idea of how that actually works, what happens is for each one of these steps that begins with the word given, when, or then, So for each one of the steps, I've defined somewhere basically a regular expression that captures an instance of that step, and then I can use the body of this code to actually run my integration. Right? So for example, uh, when I have a step that says, given customer tomfoolery has label volunteer, somewhere I've defined a regular expression that captures, there it is, given customer somebody has label something, um, and this is actually code that sets up the state of the world so as to make that set of preconditions true. Right? Uh, similarly, uh, if I have actions like when I go to such and such a page or you know, I, then I press a button, save changes, part of Cucumber is a back end that essentially has a browser simulator that looks at the output from the app and tries to take these actions. So it, you know, it'll look for a form uh, or it'll look for a checkbox with a certain label next to it. It'll do the equivalent of checking that box and submitting the form. And for the then steps, uh, the then steps are basically assertion checking, right? When I do some action, then the state of the world should be something else. Uh, and for example, uh, a step that says, sorry, it's kind of hard, and there, uh, and uh, the customer Tom Fulu should have this new label that I just applied. Uh, indeed, here's a step that matches that regular expression, and essentially it just looks for the, the patron and it makes sure that the array of labels associated with it includes the one that I specified. Um, by the way, it should be no surprise that given, when, and then are synonyms for the same method, right? They're there to help us distinguish setting up preconditions versus taking an action versus checking the post conditions. Um, but it's exactly in these little details that it actually seems to resonate with the students. You can write down in prose what it's supposed to do, albeit kind of a stylized, formalized prose. And I said this also serves as an integration test. Uh, indeed, if I, there we go. Uh, so if I run the Cucumber tool, uh, it's actually taking as input that file you just saw um, and it's going to treat it as runnable code. It's going to look at each one of the steps, find the appropriate regular expression, and green is good, right? Green means that the result of trying to run that step was successful, um, but this is now also my acceptance test because this was derived from the story describing what I said I wanted to implement, right? And to the extent that I actually sat down with a customer to come up with those stories, uh, I now have sort of an acceptance and integration test for free, and this becomes part of my integration regression. So a typical project will have you know, hundreds of stories like this. Um, and by the way, for, for those of you who do JavaScript hacking and stuff, there is also a Cucumber backend that works with Selenium. So you can actually write steps that will fire up a real web browser, remote control it, and make sure that the right JavaScript-oriented things happen as part of your acceptance tests. So what's, you know, what's the cycle? What you saw, you saw a completed user story where I had all these steps, I had regular expressions to match all of the steps, and when I actually ran it, you saw that the steps all passed. Uh, however, the process by which we get the students to develop this is incremental. Uh, and in particular, we start with write one step of a scenario and watch it fail. Right? So in, in a world in which I had not yet written any code for my app, if I went back to this uh, integration test file that I showed you, the very first line here is uh, given the label volunteer exists. Um, if I haven't written any code for what a label is and what classes and methods are associated with it, that step, by definition, must fail, right? There's no code for it to run, and that's exactly what we're looking for. We're looking for the test to immediately fail so that now you say, okay, what code do I need to write to make that test pass? Uh, well, I need to figure out from my CRC cards what is a possible breakdown of classes, methods, and responsibilities that are going to implement that behavior, and I'll start by writing a single unit test for one behavior of one class, right? So before writing any code, I write a test which, by definition, must fail, and then I write just enough code to make that one test pass. And I keep doing that until I've got enough code written for the first scenario step to pass. So now I'm at the point where, given this label exists, is a passing action. I haven't done anything else. 
but I have a class that implements labels, and I have some methods that I can call to create them and destroy them, and I've got that one step passing. Now I do this recursively, and at each step I factor out commonality in my tests and look for places where that's telling me that I need to refactor my classes as well. Right? So I'm actually developing, by driving the classes with tests, I get better modularity, I get the kind of test that I would have had to write anyway, um, and I see refactoring opportunities as they arise rather than having to sort of go back and do it all in one big block. So once I've got the scenario step passing, uh, I factor out the commonality in my step definitions, right? At my, the level of my integration test, there may be macros that I could define to capture common sequences of interactions. Like the idea of logging in is a multi-step process, but it's probably going to get used all over the place. So I could have an opportunity to factor that out as a separate integration test macro, and then I repeat that until I've got my entire scenario running. All right, now, the nice thing about this is that each individual step is relatively fine-grained. So if you've got only two hours to do something, you could make progress in two hours. You could make progress in one hour. Um, and again, when we're talking about undergrads that have 25 million things to juggle besides this class, this actually turns out to be useful. Right? They can do a small amount of work. It's self-contained. They've made real measurable progress. And they can put it aside and come back to it tomorrow and continue to get work done. So the, the way that we teach them uh, to think about it is in terms of red-green refactor, which again comes out of the test-first development community. Um, it's a radical idea about thinking about what your code should do before you start writing it. Um, and it's, it, a lot of undergrads reacted rather strongly to this idea at first. Uh, but the idea is that you capture the thing that you wish your code would do or the code you wish you had, uh, you embody it in a failing test. Right? Because you don't have the code, you only wish you had it. Um, and then from there, you write the simplest possible code that actually succeeds. And as you add more functionality, you, start, you do your refactoring incrementally as you go. So the, the, game, the, the name of the game here is to always have working code. And each time you're starting to add a new feature, you're sort of, it's going to fail for the minimum amount of time possible. Because you're going to write one unit test for one behavior. It fails. You get that one behavior to pass. And now you're back in the green state. So this view of life is that you've always got a body of code that works, and you're temporarily making small deviations that temporarily fail, but just long enough to patch that one thing that you just added. Right? So we try to really get students thinking in terms of always have something that's working and always have something deployable. Uh, so speaking of deployment, uh, now they've, you know, they've implemented this user story. Uh, they've got some new code working. The code is actually tested, because they wrote the test before writing the code. Um, <clears throat> The other thing that they need to be able to do is come up with reasonable estimates of how much more of this they'll be able to do by the, the project deadline. Uh, so for that, we use uh, velocity to plan iterations. And again, the you know, simplest possible thing you can think of, um, the idea is that we think of each week as one iteration of the project. And really, what I've just shown you is essentially a mini life cycle, uh, you know, waterfall life cycle within an iteration. You go from a high level version of the idea, like sketches and user stories, to a slightly more detailed version in terms of these scenarios, which then become running code. And you estimate, when you come up with these scenarios, how difficult you think it's going to be to do them, using a very crude estimate of you know, one point is really easy, five points is a lot of work. And what if it's more than five points? Well, then your scenario is too complicated. And you need to break it down into chunks, each of which is less than five points. Um, and you start tracking, this week, here's what I think I'm going to do. And it adds up to this many points. So it, becomes very easy to estimate the velocity, which is the number of total points your team delivered over the course of the week. Right? A, a team member will check out a story that's worth three points. They'll work on it. They'll check it back in with working tests. You've delivered three points. And as you adjust you know, a, over a, a two or three week moving average, you can figure out in steady state about how much you're delivering. Uh, and the tracking tool will then automatically adjust your schedule for you and say, here's the next 10 stories in your queue. But at the rate you're going, you're only going to finish five of them. And then you're forced to actually reprioritize and decide which ones you want to work on next. Uh, so we use uh, Heroku for deployment, which is basically hosted as, uh, Rails hosted as a service. Uh, we encourage people to do branch per feature and branch per release, which is, I think, fairly standard for, for small teams. Uh, but a lot of them have never used version control before. Um, and just as with uh, red, green refactor, the goal is at the end of every iteration, you deploy something that's working uh, onto the public deployment site. Maybe you haven't necessarily added any new features. Maybe you completed zero points that week. Uh, or maybe the points you completed were back-end improvements that aren't visible as part of the UI. That may be fine. But the expectation is starting from the very first week of your project, there's a public URL that anybody can go to and see what you've done so far. And the expectation is it always works to do that. Right? That's part of the evaluation. 
Um, also, when we sit down with the students every couple of weeks, we're actually able to look at their tracker uh, information and we can see what kind of progress they're actually making. Right? We can actually spot uh, projects that might be in trouble pretty early on. Um, for those of you who haven't used Tracker, this is kind of uh, a screenshot of what it looks like. But the stuff on the left is stories that have been completed. You could see there's like these little tick marks next to each story estimating how hard whoever submitted the story thought that they were. Uh, here's the stories that somebody in your team is working on. You can have a number of collaborators uh, on the same project. The backlog is stories you thought you'd have completed by this week, but you didn't because your velocity has actually fallen below what your initial estimate was. And then on the right are stories that uh, have been requested, but nobody's actually started working on yet. So you get a pretty nice vision. And this is, uh, it's not open source, but it's free for nonprofit and academic use. They're going to start charging for the commercial version. Uh, but it's a nice hosted tracking tool that we didn't have to do anything to come up with. And besides being valuable for the students, we require them to add us as observers on all their projects. So we can actually very quickly look at snapshots of where the different student teams are and uh, spot problematic situations pretty quickly. So I think you know, what the Agile process buys us uh, in terms of this course is th it has a fine enough granularity that even with an hour or two at a time of work, which is often uh, what you know, very high pressured undergrads are able to do, uh, they can actually get real productive work done and they can measure that progress. And the overall code that comes out of the back end of this uh, seems to us to be of higher quality versus the, oh my god, we have to pull four all-nighters and deliver a big lump of code so that the demo runs. Um, their test coverage is actually a lot better. I, I have some pretty good stats from uh, the fall version of the class that I'll share with you shortly. Um, and the fact that we can track velocity by using the user story as a kind of a unit of work means that we can do a, a reality check on whether students are delivering stuff each week or if they really are setting themselves up for failure with a demo that they'll never uh, be able to possibly do. Um, and I think what's new really in the last three or four years is that all the tools for doing this are either open source or hosted as a service. And they're now good enough that you can use them in an undergraduate course. Uh, undergraduate courses are a really harsh service environment for any kind of software because you have one instructor or a small number of TAs who have to be able to support a, a large number of students who might have problems getting stuff installed or getting stuff running. So the idea that, that the tools are now good enough uh, to be used reliably in this environment is something that I think is kind of new in the last two or three years. Um, I've talked mostly about the projects, but uh, in the interest of completeness, uh, some other non-project homeworks that we get the students to do. Um, there's some basic calisthenics, like finger exercises for learning the language and the framework, uh, exercises to learn the tools. So some students have never used revision, uh, revision control in more than a trivial way. So how do you create a branch? How do you do a branch merge? How do you resolve conflicts? Uh, we, we need to get them to understand that process. Um, we do things like get them to write an acceptance test for a website that already exists. You know, when I go to Twitter and I look up, you know, my friend, then I should see a page with my friend's last 10 tweets. You can write a cucumber test that does that, and it teaches you how to use the tool so that when it comes time to write your own app, you'll be able to start from the integration test and drive your code from that. Um, and we also do some interesting experiments that would just have been impossible three years ago. Uh, we actually give students the experience of watching a database tip over when you saturate it and then turning on various kinds of caching and asking how effective is each kind of caching depending on how the workload is trying to hammer your application. Uh, so to do this, we actually just deploy uh, a bunch of app servers in front of a MySQL database in Amazon's cloud. They're kind enough to donate some money as, as they do for uh, pretty much anybody doing this kind of work. Um, and that actually lets you know, sort of 20 teams of students have access to 10 or 20 servers each all at the same time. There's no way we could do that with Berkeley's resources, or I think, for that matter, there's no way any university could do that with on-site resources. So I think kind of a sidelight of all this is one of the things that interests us as educators about inexpensive cloud computing is we can actually give students an experience, even in microcosm form, uh, of a kind of scenario that otherwise they would never see until they were in industry and they were on the job and, and had to learn it then. Um, so how is this going so far? And uh, do another sanity check here. Um, so we've gotten a bunch of feedback. We've, we've now just completed, depending on how you count, the third or fourth iteration of a course. Uh, and this is by far the most complete iteration in that we ha have a strong focus on testing uh, all of the software engineering pedagogy that would normally be in this kind of course, um, as well as delivering a software as a service demo as part of your final course project. So we've gotten feedback from students who took a previous iteration of this before the material was sort of fully cooked. Uh, that means that those students also took 
a software engineering course at Berkeley that was not based on this approach. So they actually have a comparison point, which is pretty interesting. Uh, of course, we get student evaluations uh, for both the experimental and the current version of the course, and a number of students who went through the course and then helped us run the course in later semesters, um, which is useful for us because we could see what students actually found hard and, and beef up our pedagogy there. So what kind of feedback have we gotten? When we started uh, in early 2008, uh, one of our earliest discoveries was what we thought was a, a unbelievable lack of tool sophistication, I think, on the part of a lot of students. Um, in the old days, which is, you know, depending on who you are, it's anywhere from five years ago to 30 years ago, um, the standard set of skills that you'd sort of pick up in a programming class were a Unix-like environment and what we think of as the Unix development tool chain. Um, we found that that's increasingly not the case. Uh, people are used to IDEs most often under Win32. And I love IDEs, but they don't necessarily expose the details of what's going on when the IDE does things for you. Uh, so they weren't used to using revision control. They weren't used to uh, how those things worked when they were in a team environment. Um, there were also gaps in programming knowledge, uh, despite the fact that we have, a, I think, a very good entry-level class at Berkeley uh, into the major called Structure and Interpretation of Computer Programs. If anybody has taken this class because you've gone to either Berkeley or MIT, uh, it's based on a really excellent book by Abelson and Sussman that uses Scheme as the teaching medium, and you learn about higher-order programming, you learn about object-oriented programming, you learn about functional programming. It's kind of a grand tour of big ideas in programming and abstraction. And unfortunately, what we found is that students, who even who did very well in that course, would not have the opportunity to bring some of those ideas back into their regular programming because all, all the courses are being taught in Java and C++, languages that don't really support some of these paradigms terribly well. Um, and as I said before, uh, essentially no real understanding of the right way to think about testing and, and what kind of emphasis it really deserves relative to the rest of your activities. So this is kind of where we started. Um, and you know, through our experience, we found that uh, using software as a service as a course driver uh, that turned out to be one of the appeals of the course. Kind of part of the feedback we've gotten is the fact that we could design our own apps and think of what we wanted to do uh, was actually a major appeal of the course. Um, and because we're giving the students pretty high productivity frameworks uh, like Rails, we expect that the projects are going to actually work, as opposed to you know we're going to demo a bunch of individual pieces of our app, but we never really got them to work together. Um, we learned that it was not uncommon in some of these project courses for the project to work in pieces, but never really as an integrated unit. Um, but again, because we've sort of refactored the workflow into, you're going to deliver feature by feature, but each feature, when delivered, is going to have been tested, is going to have been driven from a scenario that you wrote down uh, in terms of an interaction with an actual user, um, projects actually do tend to work. They end up having to cut some features as they get close to the demo, but the features they do have are actually self-contained and working. And that, that's, I, I think the students appreciate that. Um, the fact that the semester goes at a fast pace and students have a lot of other courses to juggle simultaneously with this, uh, we think makes uh, a good fit for this agile iteration-based approach because they can do a small amount of work at a time and we can actually check on whether they're delivering something every week as opposed to letting things lapse. Um, and they're using tools that are essentially the same as what they're probably going to be using at any number of companies if they become professional developers. So some interesting reactions we've gotten to the most recent version of the course. Um, these are, by the way, these are adapted from the student evaluations they fill out. This is my favorite one. Uh, I feel like I'm writing more lines of test than lines of code. And my reaction was, that's great. Welcome to real life. Right? It's not uncommon to have your lines of test equal or exceed the lines of code. You just haven't been taught that way so far. Uh, this was another one. So wait, if I, my code is working, but now I changed its design, I, I also have to change the tests so that they, change the, they test the new design. Uh, and again, our reaction was, Yes, welcome to real life. Testing really is the tail that wags the dog. Um, this is another one. We feel like we're reusing a lot of stuff and repurposing it, but not writing a lot of new code, um, as if that somehow was a bug. So you know, the idea that you're evaluated on what functionality you deliver, not the number of lines of code you wrote, uh, is something that we have found ourselves disabusing students of. Um, Behavior-driven development and test-first development is weird. Usually, I just sit down and start coding. And then I test it out later. So again, you know, th these are in the category of I'm glad you had this reaction. And, and hopefully, uh, after taking this class, you, maybe your views on this are somewhat different. Uh, language construct foo is hard to understand. A typical value for foo would be closures are hard to understand. Higher order functions are hard to understand. Functional idioms like list comprehensions are hard to understand. But really, hard to understand turns out to be a placeholder for absent from Java. 
uh, because that's really the medium that most students had gotten used to. And the truth is, every one of the constructs available in Ruby was available in Scheme, and we were getting this comment from kids who had gotten an A in the Scheme class. So the concepts are not that hard to understand. They understood them before, they just haven't had a chance to put the understanding into practice in the code that they themselves write. Um, and that's an opportunity that I think the current generation of scripting languages gives us that opportunity. A few years ago, it didn't. Um, I did most of my grad student scripting in Perl, and you know, God forgive me, there's no way I would have been able to do this class uh, with the kinds of tools we had then. Uh, this is another good one. Um, what do you mean we have to search the web to find answers to our questions or to help debug obscure error messages? You know, what do we mean you have to, what, what you're saying we have to look at Stack Overflow and ask a question there? Or can't we just look up the answer in the documentation? Um, and I think this is an artifact of this very fast-moving environment of applications that are deployed in the cloud are using libraries and, and back-end services that are evolving extremely rapidly. Uh, a related version of this is, what do you mean the APIs are evolving? You mean my program doesn't run because I wrote it against API version 2 and now it's API version 3? What's up with that? Um, and I think it's interesting to give the students exposure to the fact that this is what programming is like if you're in the software as a service world, and this is not going to change. Three years from now, the libraries that are unstable today will be stable, but there'll also be cool new libraries to integrate with new services that just appeared, and they won't be stable, and their APIs will be evolving. So the idea of programming against a moving target and, and managing that in a safe way is actually a skill we wanted them to learn. And, and these comments, although they're phrased in a negative way, suggest that we're succeeding in getting them to see that, that this is a fact of life. Um, some highlights from the current iteration. We had two, remember these are student projects uh, done over about a seven or eight week period. Two projects that had 100% C0 unit test coverage. Um, not, and one of them also had more than 600 integration tests and they wrote their own integration test macros that went above and beyond what we had asked for. Um, so, you know, kind of what we get out of this is not only did they get testing, they didn't hate it. They came to actually see that it had value as a way of measuring their progress and, and uh, ensuring the solidity of their code. <clears throat> a lot of projects had non-trivial integration with third-party services. So the idea that uh, if you are using geolocation or maps or whatever, you should find the best possible service out there that already does it and understand how to integrate that with your service. That is a different skill than trying to code stuff from scratch. Uh, same thing with Facebook Connect. It was really easy to convince people that Facebook was a valuable thing they could add to their applications. And this was an excuse to understand concepts like three-party authentication, which is one of the things that you have to know uh, to use third-party services that require credentials. A couple of students even integrated with uh, UC Berkeley's own authentication so that they could write applications that had different behavior depending on whether you logged in as a student or logged in as a faculty member. Um, and in fact, a couple of those projects are becoming departmental applications. One of them is going to be used for uh, undergrads to match their interests with a research project they can join, uh, as well as to, in a social networking kind of sense, get comments from their peers about what it is like to work with different faculty members. I can assure you that's a new feature in a research match application. Um, and we have our uh, upcoming visit day for EECS graduate admissions. Uh, one of the perennial problems we have is uh, solving the stable marriage problem so that students want to meet with faculty, faculty want to meet with the strongest students, and uh, some alumni from our class are actually working on this. And, and they've been deploying uh, new releases of this every week. So I have uh, screenshots from success stories, but you know, I think what we've learned from this class so far is with good tools, students can not only understand testing, but they can actually not hate it. Uh, they can even grow to like it. And I think part of it is the testing tools really are better in this ecosystem. And that's uh, something that, I, you know, I think that the main reason we haven't aggressively moved the course to something like Python with App Engine, honestly, is this. The testing tools are so good that we can actually get students to enjoy the act of test creation. And that just, that seems like it's too good to pass up for the time being. Um, having said that, for most people coming into the class, Ruby is new for them. Uh, they've either not seen it at all or seen it kind of very, very, uh, you know, sporadically or in passing. And the truth is, any, any choice of language, to some extent, Python is changing this a little bit, but most non-Java languages would be new to a lot of these undergrads. Um, but on the other hand, it's not that hard of a language to learn, and it's a productive enough one that you can get polished working projects. Uh, we can tie some of these ideas like closures and metaprogramming back to early things that they learned uh, early in their CS careers. Um, and the testing tools are really good, so they learn to actually embrace testing. And this is, I think this one is underrated. The code density is high enough that it avoids feels like work code. And I feel compelled to present an example of this only because I, I didn't realize how strongly I felt about this. Here's the simplest Java class in the universe that you can imagine. Um, and the only line of code that does anything is the line that's in red. It computes the area of a circle. 
All the other stuff is code you have to write just to get things off the ground. And I think there's a level at which that amount of clutter gets in the way of understanding the real concept, and it feels like work when it really isn't, right? Here's the same class in Ruby. There's just fewer characters on the screen, right? That means fewer opportunities to make a mistake. So don't interpret this as arguing for Ruby. Or, uh, interpret it as arguing for getting the language out of the way of learning important concepts. Uh, Ruby and Python, I think, have the benefit that you can also use them to do real stuff. Um, succinctness, um, same thing, right? Uh, it's, you, you probably have to stare at that for a while to figure out what it does, but this one is a little bit easier. It requires that you remember something about the functional style of programming, but you can almost read what it does even if you've never seen Ruby. Again, I'm not arguing for Ruby the language. I'm arguing for if we want people to understand software engineering concepts, we've got to get the language out of the way. And understanding what's the right tool for the job uh, is an important part of that. Um, I'm an unabashed fan of the scheme course that I mentioned earlier, uh, and I think the idea that we're, be, we're able to bring back some of these big ideas and show how they optimize for programmer productivity, uh, again, it's something that modern scripting languages allow us to do in a way that even you know, a few years ago was not possible. So uh, I would say, let me just sum up. Uh, I think what, what we've kind of taken away from all of this is CS curricula right now are depth first. Uh, there's a database course, there's a security course, there's a networks course. To do software as a service, or indeed almost any professional programming job you might have, you actually need to be conversant with a wider variety of things than ever. Uh, so that I think there's a structural issue here that, that uh, over the long term we're going to have to address as educators. But what we had found was that students wanted to create web apps, and they wanted to create mobile apps, and we weren't teaching them methodologies that allowed them to do that in a good way. So they were osmosing bad practices in order to write the apps they actually wanted. Um, we can now avoid that, right? The opportunity is there because the languages are good, the tools are good, the testing tools are really good, and inexpensive cloud computing means that it's, there's basically no barrier to affordability uh, in terms of being able to deploy this uh, even at a, you know, in a relatively financially modest setting. So I think in the interest of time, um, I want to, yeah, I think I want to wrap up and see if, if people have questions they want to talk about stuff. I, I saw this in a bathroom at Google once and I thought it was great. So I've, I've been using it in all my classes and uh, without permission from anybody. So I hope that's okay. But thank you guys for sticking around. I, I think it's only a one hour slot, right? So officially, I have to stop, but I don't have anything to do until 2.30. And if anybody is interested in any aspect of this, I would love to talk to you. So thank you very much. You guys have, have been great.